everyone, and welcome to the webinar on organ donation in Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Megan Dowling, and I'm the program coordinator with the Kidney Foundation of Canada Atlantic Branch. I'm very excited to be with all of you here today and pleased to be partnering with Angela Parsons from Organ Procurement and Exchange of Newfoundland and Labrador. So before um, I introduce our speaker today, I just wanna go over a few items to let you know how to participate in today's webinar. So by default, all of you have entered the webinar with your audio muted, and we just do this to uh, help lower any background noises, which helps us to keep the webinar flowing smoothly. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you will receive a follow-up email within a few days that will have a link for on-demand viewing and a copy of the PowerPoint slides used today. So a copy of Angela's PowerPoint slides. In this email, there will also be an anonymous survey about how today's webinar went. It's just a short survey and we ask that if you do have time to please, <clears throat> excuse me, to please fill it out and provide your feedback. Your feedback is very important to us and it allows us to improve our future webinars and tailor them to what you wish to learn about. Since we are all muted, you will have the opportunity to submit questions through text. Uh, uh, through typing. So there's two ways that you can do this, either through the chat box or the question box. You can send your questions in at any point uh, during the presentation. If you do submit them through the chat box, your name will come up with the question. But if you do want to submit questions anonymously, you can do so in the question and answer uh, box and you just check off anonymous. And so we'll do our best to get to all of your questions today. If for some reason uh, we run out of time and we can't, we will send a list of answers with the follow-up uh, email. So there is another way that you can participate in today's webinar and that's through polls. Uh, Angela, our speaker has prepared a number of questions to ask you all throughout the webinar. All you have to do to participate is click on the answer that you think is correct or best describes you when it pops up on your screen. And all polls are anonymous. Uh, they are preset to be anonymous. So whatever your answer is, we can't see who, um, who answered, just the amount of numbers. So with that said, let's practice our first poll question. Okay. So you should all be able to see this on your screen. Uh, since we're the Kidney Foundation, we have a kidney-related question. It's which statements, you can choose more than one for this question, uh, which statements best describe you? The first one is, I'm a kidney patient, I'm on dialysis, I am a recipient of one or more kidney transplants, I'm a living kidney donor, I am a family member of someone with kidney disease, I'm a caregiver of someone with kidney disease, or I'm not connected to kidney disease. So all you have to do is uh, click on the answer that best describes you, just on the screen there. And I see people are still in the process of voting. So we'll just wait a couple of more seconds. All right. We have a few more coming in. Perfect. So here's the results. So we, most of us are not connected can, uh, to kidney disease, but we do have a couple of people who are family members of someone with kidney disease. All right. Perfect. Okay. So I am very pleased to introduce Angela Parsons. She is the Organ Donor Coordinator for Organ Procurement and Exchange of Newfoundland and Labrador. Angela is a registered nurse and organ donor coordinator. Uh, she has been a registered nurse for almost 10 years, 
spending time on surgery floors and in long-term care, emergency, and in critical care ICU. Angela joined the organ donor program in Newfoundland and Labrador in November of 2019. And she has a five month old Westie uh, named Sophie, in addition to four more fur babies. So you are definitely being kept very busy. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to welcome and pass the floor over to Angela. So Angela, I'll stop sharing my screen here and you can start sharing yours. Great. Thanks for the lovely introduction, Megan. And thanks everybody for showing up this morning. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here now. All right, so I'm ready to go. Megan, is it okay to go ahead? Yep, I can see your screen. Okay. So everyone, of course, I'm here to talk about organ donation. So I'm gonna provide some education on how to become an organ donor and the process involved in organ donation. So what is OPEN? So of course, that's an acronym. Us nurses love our acronyms. So it stands for Organ Procurement and Exchange of Newfoundland and Labrador. On our team, we have Kim Parsons, Greg Lovett, Jody Winter, and myself. So why are donors needed? Over 4,350 Canadians are on the wait list for organ transplant. There's 3,014 transplant procedures were performed in Canada in 2019. That's an increase of 42% since 2010. 249 Canadians died while waiting for transplant in 2019. Since COVID, registration for organ donation has went down by 39% and transplants went down 30% across Canada. So as we're collaborating with the Kidney Foundation, we have a specific uh, slide for kidney disease. There's over 40,000 Canadians, excluding Quebec, uh, that are living with end-stage kidney disease. Of those 56.8% of those are receiving some form of dialysis. That's an increase of 33% since 2019. Newfoundland and Manitoba have the highest rates of new patients in 2019. The number of kidney transplants performed per year increased 41% in 2019. There's 496 recipients that are living with a functioning kidney transplant as of 2020 in Newfoundland. In 2020, there were 16 kidney transplants and 18 kidney transplants in 2019. Of those people, they were from Newfoundland. There are 45 people on the wait list for a kidney transplant as of 2020. And again, that's for here in Newfoundland. So a rare opportunity, you're let, there's less than 5% of all hospital deaths qualify. You're six times more likely to need a transplant than to be able to donate. Uh, donation provides life-saving opportunities for thousands of Canadians. Organ donation is also cost-effective treatment for organ failure. So one kidney transplant can save the healthcare system anywhere from $33,000 to $84,000 per year, simultaneously improving outcomes and the quality of life. And of course, it can bring comfort and a legacy of life to families coping with the loss of a loved one. And I believe we have a poll question. So what organs can you donate? Kidneys and liver, heart and lungs, pancreas and small bowel, or all of the above? So, all of the above, of course, yep, that's correct. So what can be donated? So you have your heart, your lungs, which can be split, your kidneys can actually be split and go to different people, your liver, pancreas, and small bowel. So in Newfoundland, we don't really do uh, much small bowel, that's uh, more geared toward pediatrics. So here are the types of organ donation. So you have living donation, 
So that's if someone needs a kidney, say your brother, and you donate it, that's a living donation. Um, donation after circulatory determination of death, we call DCD, the cardiac death. Um, we're not doing that in Newfoundland right now. There is a lot of places across Canada doing it. We're in the works of implementing. Um, so basically that means you have a severe brain injury, but are not actually brain dead, but your prognosis is poor. Uh, and then number three, donation after neurological determination of death, which is brain death. And we shorten that and call it NDD. So that's what we do here in Newfoundland. So neurological death, again, brain death, there's no spontaneous breathing. The pupils are fixed and dilated. There's no motor responses. The patient has no reflexes. There's no blink, cough, or gag reflex. So these are irreversible. The brain does not regenerate or come back to life. So of course, brain death is death. It cannot be fixed. So it's between this time that do an organ donation is possible. The donor is maintained in the ICU while tests are being completed to determine the suitability and safety of the organs. A breathing machine and drugs are used to keep the body functioning until the organs are matched and the donor goes to the OR. So here we have a scan uh, of somebody who's brain dead. And as you can see, the very middle where your brain is, is black. That shows us that there is no blood flow. And you can see around the scalp and face that there is blood flow. So common causes of brain death. So it's usually a tragic accident of some sort. It's unexpected, a uh, severe head injury, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, so that's like a brain bleed, a cerebrovascular injury, so a stroke or aneurysm, blood clot of some form in the brain. Uh, someone who's had prolonged CPR and a lack of oxygen to the brain, uh, some brain cancers, drug overdoses, suicides, homicides. So again, we have another scan for you to see. You see your normal conscious person, someone after cardiac arrest, so there's a slight bit of blood flow coming back to the brain there. And of course, your brain death patient with no brain activity. And I believe we have now another couple of poll questions. So what is the maximum age to be an organ donor? 50, 65, 80, or there is no age limit? And number two, can a person with current health issues, such as heart disease or kidney disease, still be an organ donor? Yes or no? All right, so good, yeah, 100% maximum age. There is no age limit. Um, and then we have a mix here of yes and no. So can a person with the current health issues such as heart disease or kidney disease still be a donor? So most have said yes. So who can be a donor? So anyone in Newfoundland and Labrador can become an organ donor as long as they are neurologically deceased, so brain dead. Potential donors will be transported to St. John's for donation at no cost to the family. So you were correct in saying there was no age limit. Our oldest donor was actually 93. And one people are always unsure about is that even people with severe illnesses can still donate. So if you have MS, kidney disease, heart disease, even HIV, hep C, um, everyone is looked at individually. A person may still donate an organ even if they have a current illness. Uh, so what happens here is say we had a hep C donor and they matched with someone, say a kidney. So what happens then they go under a clause called exceptional distribution. And what happens is the recipient, the transplant surgeon will go to that recipient and will tell them, say, you know, we have a kidney for you. However, this donor is hep C positive. Do you still want this kidney? So this person, you know, could be very ill, could be, you know, in the hospital close to death. Uh, and they usually will say yes. So hep C is actually treatable now. Um, 
And sometimes, you know, there's people on the wait list that are hep C positive as well. So you'd be very surprised that sometimes what organs can be donated and who will actually accept those. Um, so even some treated cancers uh, can still become donors. And of course, remember organ donation is actually life-saving. So discussing organ donation, it's helping families make their best decision in their worst moment based on their values and beliefs. So the donation discussion. So after a person is declared brain dead, the family are asked if they would like to speak with an open coordinator about organ donation. If the family agrees, the open coordinator will meet privately with the family and are provided education on the opportunity for organ donation. This allows the family to make an informed decision. It is the family's right to choose. If organ donation proceeds, the open coordinator will complete a medical screening questionnaire and gather legal consent. So a legal authority to consent here in Newfoundland, the first person for legal consent uh, is your marital spouse. And unfortunately in Newfoundland, common law is not recognized. Uh, we're in the works of trying to change that. Uh, if no marital spouse, it would be legal age children, 19 in Newfoundland. If no one there, a parent, no parent, it would be a sibling of legal age. And then if nobody there, it would be any other person's legal age next to kin. And last but not least is a person lawfully in possession of the body, such as the medical examiner. So the timeline. So donation, we tell families, usually takes place at least 24 to 48 hours or more. Uh, since COVID and of course flight restrictions in Newfoundland, uh, sometimes this is increased. And of course we tell the family that. Uh, it also depends on the retrieval team's arrival to the province. And of course, Newfoundland, it, weather may delay the process, so snowstorms, fog, things like that. Uh, once it does take place, we're in the OR anywhere from four to six hours. So the family follow-up. So we then would contact the next of kin after the retrieval, and we'll give them an update on what organs have been retrieved. Uh, so then we send a letter about four to six weeks after the OR to the donor family, and we let them know what organs were successfully transplanted. Something else that we do is something called a celebration of courage. Uh, we do it every about two to three years. Depends on the numbers of donors we've had. Um, this is something, it's a private ceremony. Only family members or friends of the donors are present. You know, there's music, there's uh, medallions given to the family members. It's a really nice service. So here we have one per person can donate up to eight life-saving organs. So something ischemic time. So this is important uh, as we're in Newfoundland, all the teams have to fly back to their province with the organs. So ischemic time, how long an organ is viable outside the body. So the heart is the shortest amount of time we can send geography wise. Uh, it lasts about four to six hours. Uh, a long will last about six to eight hours hours outside of the body. The pancreas is about eight to 12. Uh, liver is 12 to 18 and a kidney is 24 to 48. So of course with technology advances, the heart they're making right now, something called heart in a box. Uh, the States has it right now. Canada is in the process of implementing it. They're in um, doing trials right now. So if there, this were to take place, we could actually send our hearts all the way to BC. Uh, the lungs also can go in a machine that we do have available. It's called ex vivo. So when we put the lungs in this machine, it actually, you know, ventilates these lungs. Uh, doctors can then treat the lungs for any infections. They can clean the lungs up. Uh, it allows them to make sure the lungs are in perfect condition. And even the kidney actually can go on pumps. And so it prolongs that time as well. So transplant info. So Newfoundland does not have a transplant team. We only do organ procurement donation here in Newfoundland. Newfoundland donor organs are retrieved by a transplant team and brought back to the province the recipient is in. So Newfoundlanders awaiting transplants can live at home if they're waiting on a kidney, liver, or pancreas. They will have to travel to receive their transplant surgery. So that's usually Halifax. If Newfoundlanders are waiting for lung or heart transplants, 
they can live in the city where the transplant will take place. So due to the short amount of time, these organs can survive outside the body. So that's usually Halifax, Ottawa, or Toronto. All donor and recipient information is confidential. Families can communicate with each other through our program by written letters. And I believe we have a poll question again. All right, so do you know how to register your intent to be an organ donor, yes or no? Oh, well, that's great. Everyone said yes. So of course we have it here. What should I do if I want to be an organ donor? And we say having the conversation with your family about your wishes to be an organ donor, it's just as important as putting your intent to donate on your NCP card. So you can go online, update your intent to donate on your NCP card. This is your intent, not a legal declaration. So again, that's why discussing with your families were very important. And of course we have the link here for those that wouldn't know. And so since moving the intent to become an organ donor from a driver's license to your MCP, 38% of Newfoundland has registered their intent to donate. And I know that sounds low, but 38% is actually great progress as most provinces are only at about 20%. And again, here's the link. So this site allows you to update your MCP, your car registration, and even get a wood cutting permit. So without the organ donor, there is no story. There is no hope, no transplant. But when there is an organ donor, life springs from death, sorrow turns from hope, and the terrible loss becomes a gift. So I do have a little video for you guys to watch. I'm hoping it'll work. Oh, it looks like it went great. Um, and it's about a local donor. And then we'll hopefully take some questions after this is done. After this slide, I do have another video. Uh, it's just a recommendation for you to watch if you're interested in how the donation transplantation process works. It's uh, about 45 minutes long, the other one. So if you are interested, you can watch that. So I'll hit play. I lost my son uh, at the end of July. Uh, at that moment in time, during all that trauma, um, our family made a decision that we would donate his young, healthy organs uh, so that others would have a second chance at life. Jeff was, uh, well, he was young, and, and the type of person that Jeff was, he was, um, his friends and his family meant everything. He was like my best friend. He was so protective, like a normal older brother would be. He was perfect. He was, you know, polite. He was funny. He was the type of guy that was the center of the party, the life of the party. Um, Jeff. Uh, When we arrived here in St. John's, they were totally open uh, to meet with us. Even it was like 12 o'clock at night, I think. We had the, uh, the the staff came and met with us about organ donation. Uh, Jeff wasn't neurologically, 100% neurologically deceased at the time. They couldn't call it. So we, we said, you know, like, let's look at what we could do further. I mean, it was non-survivable. We knew it was only a matter of time. They explained to us, you know, they, they kept thanking us for just considering it. You know, this may not happen, but thank you for considering it. And, you know, the, the organ procurement staff was amazing. Like, I mean, they're, they're almost like angel, earth angels, I guess. As a mother, I was still freaking out, you know? Like, I was, my child was, My child was neurologically dead, 
but his heart was still beating and he was still there. So there was times you want to run, <laughs> you know, pack it all in and run, but they kept you focused, they kept you calm. And I remember saying to Jody and my husband, my daughter and my husband, I said, you know, let's give families a good phone call rather than a bad phone call we had. You know, those people that are out there waiting on a transplant list, they can use the organs that our son has that are still viable. At the time, I guess, we were obviously caught in our own grief, but we do understand being from small communities, the importance of sharing, uh, the importance of community, and the importance of fellow man. It hasn't lessened my grief, but it puts a smile on my face in the days that the grief is bad. And it, it matters. It really, really matters because in the back of your mind, you know you've lost your child. But you know there's somebody else's child or husband or wife or grandparent out there. There's other families that are as rejoicing probably as much as you're grieving. And that's got to matter, right? Well, for me, it's a part of my brother. You know, it's a part of my brother and someone else. Just to know that, like, his heart's still beating is just, it's calming. So you really need to talk to your friends, you need to talk to your family, you need to make sure as many as possible get the message out there. Uh, because you don't know who is gonna have probably a clear mind in that time of tragedy to be able to say, hold on a second, you know? Your loved one wanted to be an organ donor, did you know? I don't think truly it meant for Jeff to be living on but a part of him and a part of his kindness and who he was would help others. You know, have a second chance at life. Smile, be the, you know, center of the party. Okay, so if you haven't turned up, I tear up every time I watch that. Um, this is the other video that you guys can watch on your own if you're interested, the nature of things. And yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, joining me this morning. And that's my little baby, Sophie. Thank you so much, Angela. That, uh, that was amazing and very, very informative. Uh, what a powerful video that was. That was, that was really, really great. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I learned so much <laughs> through this presentation. The heart in the box, what a great thing. I, I personally didn't know that uh, that was a thing. So that's- Yeah, a lot of people don't. We almost had a team come and trial the box here, but uh, unfortunately they had to actually go and do a heart transplant itself. Uh, but it, it's you can watch it on YouTube. So Hawaii, uh, a lot of young people, of course, surfers were dying down there with head injuries. And their hearts were going to waste these perfectly healthy hearts. So that's what they developed the box. So now those hearts are going back to the mainland. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. The, the technology that we have now. Right. I know. It's that's crazy. Really amazing. I'm, uh, I'm happy to say we have lots of questions. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So, so we'll get to, we'll get to some of them. Hopefully we can get to all of them. Um, so our first question is in the presentation, you said, that only 5% or less are able to donate organs. So this person's wondering, uh, do you have to die in hospital to be a donor? Uh, for example, if they just were deceased at home, died at home or in a car accident, can they still donate? So the thing uh, that we need to remember for Newfoundland is you have to be neurologically dead. So if you're, you know, dead and you know everything you're gone uh you wouldn't qualify we don't do deceased donation overall uh we can only do brain death here in Newfoundland so what would happen um say someone at home had a stroke and they were brain dead they would still come into the hospital treatment and everything to save their life would happen uh once they were you know pronounced brain dead that's when we would come into play so it, it could be someone that actually fully died at home 
I mean, it could be someone in a car accident that came through eMERGE that got pronounced brain dead, but you would have to be pronounced brain dead to be able to become a donor. That's why it's such a, you know, small percentage that actually qualify. Mm -hmm. So a kind of a follow-up question would be, um, since it is such a small percentage and, you know, if it's such an important thing, if somebody is registered to be an organ donor and uh, they're in the hospital, will every effort be made to save uh, to save their life before going down that road? Yes, of course. So if someone were to come through eMERGE, I mean, it's full treatment plan, they would say then go on to ICU. Uh, everything's done just like anyone else to save your life. Organ donation isn't even come into play until you're pronounced. Um, and once that happens, then things would kind of go on the organ donation side. But before that, you know, everything has to be done and you actually have to prove that, you know, uh, when they're bringing that, that everything was done to save their life. Great. So um, every effort's made. So nobody has to worry about anything like that. Yes, of course. What about uh, the, like the process after, if you do, are, if you are registered to be an organ donor and you are eight, one of those 5% uh, to actually donate your organs, what happens um, in the sense of your body? Are you disfigured? Uh, what should your family members expect after? So what we tell families is that it's just like a normal surgical procedure where there's an incision made down the sternum down through the abdomen. It's just one straight line. Um, after, you know, the retrieval has taken place, that person is, you know, closed back up, dressing put on, so other than um, that one incision, they would, you know, their body would all remain intact. Okay. Okay. I think that can be uh, really comforting for, for families to know. Yeah. We always say, you know, you could still have open casket, things like that, if that's something that they wanted to do. Right. Right. Because that could be a, a big deterrent for, for some families. So I think it's comforting to know that. Yeah, for sure. It's still going to be intact and, and good. Yeah. What about, um, we, we had a question about if you're, if you're not on the list, if you haven't uh, made your intent to donate your decision, can your family members decide that they want you to be an organ donor? Or um, if you are registered to be an organ donor, can your family members take back that permission? So yeah, it's kind of yes to both of those. So when you sign your intent on your MCP card, uh, here in our office, we get a call, say, from ICU for the early referral, and we will actually go into our system and check everything on that person. And the first thing we check is that they, if they've registered their intent, um, again, it's not a legal document, but we usually will print that off and have it with us. So if the family want to talk to us, we will actually bring that up with us and chat with them and say, oh, so, you know, did your husband you know, did you speak about donation? Did he want, you know, to be an organ donor? And if they don't know, we have this sheet to show them. And sometimes that really helps make their decision. Um, and some families, of course, know that they wanted to. So on the other end of things, where it isn't a legal intent, uh, if the family, if the person had said, yes, they wanted to be a donor, um, the family can overrule that, uh, their legal, you know, substitution decision maker, um, so again, that's why we always say, talk to your family, make them know your wishes, because in the end, they're the ones, in fact, going to be making the decision for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so would you say, you mentioned, uh, it's, you know, it's important to talk to your family about it. And I think uh, they mentioned that in the video as well. So would you agree kind of with the statement that it is very important to have a conversation with your family? Yeah, I mean, your intent is just one thing that kind of helps give us an idea of what you might have wanted, but it's really your family. It provide it will provide them comfort of knowing that's what you wanted, because as you can imagine, it's probably the most stressful time in these people's lives. You know, they just lost their mom, their daughter, you know, their wife, their husband, and we're talking with them. And if they've never, ever had the discussion, you know, it can be a big moral dilemma for them and what they would want to do. So it's really helpful like if, you know, they know, they're like, oh yeah, we talked about this. Like she would definitely right. want to do that. So it's just helpful. Yeah. So it, it can be an extremely stressful uh, time, time when you're, you know, when you're 
having to kind of go through this process. And so it, you know, it, some people may feel a little hesitant to talk their, to their families about it, but um, it's actually, it actually can take a lot of pressure off your families in that moment. If, if you do have the conversations before. Yeah. So sometimes when families haven't spoken about it, but they've signed that intent, Sometimes people, when they see the little sheet, you know, we print off, we say, you know, they actually signed, they wanted to be an organ donor. You can see the relief on a lot of people's faces, like, oh, they did want it. Thank God I had no idea. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. So how long does the whole process, um, process take of donating your organs? And how long will your loved one be on, you know, like life sustaining um, uh, measures? So basically what happens is once they're pronounced, I mean, these people are all on a ventilator on a cardiac monitor and they're given any medication to keep their blood pressure up and such things like that. Um, They're not on any sedation, of course, because they're brain dead. So you don't have to do that. Um, It usually takes, like I said, between 24, 48 hours Uh, with COVID and the flights, it's really decreased, you know, our times. Uh, so some donors are anywhere from two to four days. We've even had donors up to five and six days. Um, we had someone in, you know, a horrible accident and their liver enzymes were really high, but this person was actually really healthy. So the recipient uh, surgeons or the transplant surgeons wanted to give it a day and the family wanted it to happen so bad that they were willing to wait. So a lot like this video, Pat Loader, her son wasn't quite neurologically dead yet. So she was willing to wait to see if it happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And it, you know, sometimes it happens very quickly and sometimes it could be days before they are actually neurologically dead. Um, But again, depending on whether mainly and getting the teens here is how fast that we get this going. I mean, we did have a recent donor, you know, 48 hours, everything was done and complete, but it can be delayed. But we always make sure the families know that up front. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, in the video, the lady referred to you guys as earth angels, which I thought was absolutely great um, and so true. And so I think it's important that, you know, people know that kind of like you said, that people are, you know, you let them know up front what will happen and you're you're there to support them as well through through that process. I think that was sure. I mean, us coordinators, when this is happening, we're here 24 seven till it's all done. And we're keeping in contact with the family this whole time, updating them on everything. So they're never left out of the loop of what's happening, you know, no big surprises. And if we get delayed, we tell them that. And I mean, it's their decision to keep going or not. Still, you know, we don't hold them to it. We understand it's very stressful. And some families like decide to wait, some families say, no, I can't. So so that actually brings up another uh, really good question throughout the process. Like you said, sometimes it can take longer um, at, at times. If like, is a family able to pull out at any point if they do decide, yes, we want to, um, we want to have our loved one's organs donated. If say it's taking a little bit longer than they expected, are they able to pull out? Yes, for sure. I mean, it, this is an illegal, you know, we don't hold them to it. Um, like I said, that's why it's so important we communicate with the family the whole time so they know what's going on. Most families, if they know that this is what their loved one wanted, you know, most of them are willing to wait. Some families actually lately have said the extra time gave them a little p- period to be able to grieve but still be with that person. Yeah. Whereas, you know, usually when someone passes away, they're gone that same day. And then it's immediate, you know, the funeral. So some people actually like that little bit of time to have extra with them. That's a really good point. You're right. Sometimes it can be very quick and um, can add to the overwhelm of it. Everything happening so quickly and having to make all of those final plans and stuff. So that's that's a really good point. Um, We do have a question. So if does the family member have the ability to say who gets the organs when they die? So if they knew somebody on the transplant plant list, can they say, I want my family members or my loved one's organs to go to them? How does that work? Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Everything's confidential. So when we go in and we send special blood work off uh, for our tissue typing, 
uh, we run, you know, the list and basically we have to match it according to our list and there's no names or anything on that list. Um, so everything is confidential in how that happens. Um, and so you, you were mentioning uh, a few minutes ago about COVID-19 and it having an effect on some of the wait times uh, with organ donation. Has, has it had any other kind of effect on organ donation? Uh, so the, of course the biggest one is like, I think in one of my slides, it decreased. I mean, organ donation was kind of at a standstill there for a while. People didn't know what to do anymore because there was such a risk. Um, and as time went on, we added extra testing to be done. Um, I mean, everybody that comes in hospital gets swabbed. So if you were going to be an organ donor where you already are intubated, you know, your breathing tube down, they actually do a test where they go down with a scope and get a sample from your lung that way. So it's the most accurate. So that's now the gold standard uh, across Canada that we do that test. Um, what about if, somebody thinks they're an organ, they're registered to be an organ donor, but aren't positive. Is there a way that they can confirm? Yeah, for sure. So the link in the presentation, the mygov.nl. So if you go on there and you don't uh, have it registered yet, you just go on, log in or sign up as actually as a new account, uh, you register and within there, like I said, you can update your NCP, you can put your intent to be an organ donor, register your car, things like that. You can do that all in there. Great, great to know that. Uh, we just had another question coming in. So once brain activity is gone, uh, is there ever a chance that a loved one can come back after that? So unfortunately, once someone's pronounced, it's a very strict protocol that the docs have to follow to pronounce someone. So two doctors, actually have to do all the testing to show that someone's brain dead. And if for any reason someone can't complete this full testing, so say someone was in that car accident and you know their pupil had blown or they burst their eardrum, that means we can't do our full testing. So what happens is uh, they go for what we call ancillary testing. So it's a cerebral blood flow scan. I had a picture of the brain in there. So we actually will send people for those. It's the most accurate way to see if there's blood flow to the brain. And once we see that and there's absolutely nothing, then, you know, they are pronounced, uh, people don't come back from that. You know, they're legally considered dead at that point. We're just keeping their body going by a ventilator and drugs. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, again, that's kind of, it's comforting to know that every, um, every measure is taken to make sure that uh, that this is a good decision to go to go forward with. Um, what if you are un, under 16? Can you donate your organs if you're under 16? You can donate. Um, your parents, though, would have to be the ones making the decision for you. Um, I haven't seen a pediatric donor yet, but we have had them. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it would be, you know, if they fall under brain death protocol, uh, the parents would be asked if they'd like to speak to us. And it's up to them, yes or no, if they even want to talk with us. If it's a no, it stops there. If it's a yes, we have the conversation and see where it goes. What if you've had cancer uh, before in your lifetime? Can you be an organ donor after that? Yeah, it depends what type of cancer. Certain like skin cancers, basal cell uh, that's treated, you can still become a donor. And then other cancers, depending on what it is, sometimes if it's past 10 year mark, you still can. So it doesn't completely rule you out. That's a, that's a good point. I think a common misconception people have is that, uh, you know, age or health condition determines whether or not you can be an organ donor. But uh, from your presentation, we've, we've learned that um, there's lots and lots of options. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, it's a good, if you do wish to be an organ donor, but you're not sure, uh, if, if you're eligible to register to be one anyways, because you just, you just never know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've had people come through ICU with, you know, every kind of comorbidity, you know, kidney disease, had a kidney transplant themselves, like bilateral amputations of their legs, heart disease. Uh, we had that happen. Actually, a woman had gotten a kidney transplant years before, and she was very adamant because of that, of being a donor. 
So same thing, she became brain dead and her family fought for that. And, you know, the team thought, oh, I see thought that they, she wouldn't be able to, but, you know, we did our background, we looked into everything and this woman ended up donating her liver. So you'd be surprised, yeah. Wow, wow. Um, we do have a, a question that I think kind of comes off of that, of that video. Um, you know, the lady in the video was talking about how important it is to get the word out there about organ donation. So if we're going to drive um, more organ donation in Newfoundland, what do you think uh, some of the best steps are to advocate for that? I think the first easiest one, like I said, is speaking with your own family on your own intent, because you never think you're going to be a donor. No one thinks that they're going to be in a car accident or, you know, they're going to have a brain bleed. So just having that initial conversation is the most important. But other than that, it's public education. So doing things like this, uh, answering questions. We were going out to schools, you know, doing high schools. Um, with COVID, of course, everything has become virtual now. So us getting out into the community has decreased a lot, even church groups uh, we've gone to. Um, so really it's the education is a big thing. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, that's all the questions that we have for today. I'm so happy that we got lots and we have lots of people attending, uh, which is really great. Just a, a quick reminder to everybody, we are, we did record this. So in a few days time, we'll have the recording up and ready to view. I'll uh, send that in a follow-up email. I'll also include Angela's slides in that email as well. So all of the links uh, that Angela talked about today, you will have access to those as well. And we will have a little survey if you do have a chance to just fill that out. It's very quick and easy. And it just allows us to continue doing these webinars. I wanna thank you so much, uh, Angela. This was, this was really, really great. Um, do you have any kind of last words that, uh, that you'd like to say? Mainly, again, just thank you to you. We were so grateful here in Oregon Procurement to be able to collaborate with the Kidney Foundation. It's amazing, you know, two of us coming together. Uh, I guess for people out there, um, you know, probably not, you know, it's not a day-to-day -day thing that you're thinking about organ donation, but it's usually, you know, someone's on that wait list for quite a long time suffering and, and you know, the family suffers as well. And they're in hospital sometimes a really long time. So something that, you probably, you know, never think about wouldn't be a big deal, but you would want to just, you know, if it's something you want, just sign up, you know, you never know, you could save, you know, many lives. Yeah. And again, again, um, the lady in the video, you know, she, she mentioned it didn't, being able to uh, donate her son's organs, it didn't necessarily make it easier, uh, but it did bring a smile to, to their faces, uh, which, um, which is really good. And and she mentioned something about, you know, again, it didn't make us it easier, but knowing uh, that they were going to help save some other lives in, in other families was, was very good. And I think uh, to your point that, you know, register to be a, an organ donor, even if you don't know if you can, it's always a good idea because you never know uh, what can happen. And, and I think uh, one of my big takeaways from this from this webinar is to really uh, make sure that you're talking to your family family about this. That's a um, really big one. Yeah, that we run into ourselves a lot is the families not knowing what the person would want. And, you know, we've had no's because the family didn't know. And sometimes these are beautiful, vital organs that could save people, you know. Exactly. That's a that's a really, really good point. Um, if you have any additional questions for myself or Angela, I just put our um, contact information in the chat there. So feel free to uh, reach out to us at any time. And again, thank you everyone for attending. And thank you so much, Angela. It was really great to collaborate uh, with Oregon Procurement and Exchange of Newfoundland and Labrador and yourself. Uh, hopefully we can do some additional webinars with you guys in the future. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And everyone that was on, thank you so much for coming on and taking a listen. And like Megan said, you have our contact here. If you ever even want your own presentation done for a group, a business, we can do online for you, you know, answer questions as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, 
with the kind of, you know, the virtual world that we have now, it does, it does make it easier to um, get into some businesses or organizations by doing it virtually. So that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Angela. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.